And now for 15 years I've been an evangelist doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I tell people up front what I believe. The Bible says very clearly that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. And I think the evolution theory that's being taught in our schools is one of the dumbest and most dangerous ideas in the history of the world. So let's draw some clear lines like the name of the conference is, okay? That ought to be a clear line right there. This is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. Uh, we have three kids and I got them all married off and the dog died, so I made it. I'm home free. <laughs> and got two grandkids, one more due in a couple months. So we're excited about this grandpa stage. Grandkids are God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. <laughs> hey, all right. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, when was the beginning? We've got a split in Christianity today over this issue. When was the beginning? How old is the earth? And if you can't get past these first three words, how are you going to know when the rest of the Bible is literal or figurative? When was the beginning? Hebrews chapter 1 says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. When was the beginning? How old is this earth, anyway? Well, in the last session we talked about if you went scuba diving and you found a treasure chest full of gold coins, and I asked you the simple question, when did the boat sink? You say, I don't know. Well, look at the dates on the coins. If there's a coin in there from 1750, you ought to be able to figure out the boat sank after 1750. How many can figure that out with no help? Okay. Well, this would be called a limiting factor. It cannot have sunk before that date. Now, there are many ways to test the age of the earth, but some of them limit the earth to less than the billions of years they're telling us in school. What we're going to look at tonight are some of the limiting factors for the age of the earth. And I'm going to tell you why I believe the Bible dates are exactly scientifically, historically, mathematically correct. This earth was created about 6,000 years ago, not millions of years ago. There was a flood 4,400 years ago. Completely destroyed the world. Dropped everybody's property value to zero <laughs> in that big flood. Now the Bible says that Jesus created all things. Colossians chapter 1. Genesis 1 says God created heaven and earth. Colossians 1 says Jesus created heaven and earth. Well, guess what? That's because Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. And Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Same thing in Mark 10, 6. Was that really the beginning when he made Adam and Eve? Well, the Bible tells us clearly in Romans chapter 5 that death came into the world because of man's sin. The reason we have death and suffering is because of man's sin. 1 Corinthians 15 says, By man came death, in Adam all die. You see, nothing died until Adam sinned. And Adam was the first man. The Bible is extremely clear on this topic. And Eve was the mother of all living. And the Bible says Adam lived 130 years and had a son and named him Seth. Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. If you go through the Bible and add up the dates, it's pretty easy to do. There's a few tricky spots in there, but basically anybody can do it. The Bible dates add up to about 6,000 years ago, not millions. And we've got these charts. If you get my seminar notebook, the last page folds out to be one of these charts. Or if you want them laminated, when you uh, use them for placemats when your skeptic friends come over for lunch. That'll be interesting... Uh, a <laughs> tool to have at your house. But clearly, you're going to get about 6,000 years ago for the creation if you add up the dates in the Bible. Now, I would say that is a limiting factor. If somebody wants to say, well, the earth is millions of years old, okay, you're welcome to believe whatever you want to believe. I don't care what you believe. However, you need to understand your belief is in conflict with the clear teaching of God's Word. And if you don't care what God says, okay, that's fine also. Just so you understand, you're conflicting with what God said and you're calling Jesus a liar. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. So the Bible dates start off at about 6,000 years ago, and then 4,400 years ago there was a big flood. Now, I do many debates at universities. I've had 86 now. I've done over 6,000 radio and TV call and talk shows. And atheists are always calling in saying, Hey, Hovind, uh, if Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, who did their sons marry, huh? Well, that's a fair question. Who did Adam's sons marry? The Bible says Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare a son, called him, etc., well, who's his wife? Well, notice it doesn't say he found her there. But who was his wife? And who did Seth marry anyway? Well, that's a good question. But that's nothing, no problem compared to what the evolutionists believe. See, they've got a serious problem. They believe 18 or 20 billion years ago, nothing exploded. 
in the Big Bang. <laughs> That's what the theory teaches. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down and it developed a hard rocky crust. Yes, boys and girls, and then it rained on the rocks. Oh, yes, millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. This is what the textbooks teach in your town, folks, okay? And then it says, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> sure is. <laughs> Don't even happen. That's how slow it is. <laughs> this guy said, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So according to the evolution theory, 20 billion years ago there was a big bang, 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down, then it rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive about 3 billion years ago. And that first life form found somebody to marry. <laughs> now there's a good trick. <laughs> and something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. So by their theory, great, 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 great grandpa was soup. <laughs> I didn't make it up. That's what they teach. Okay, anyway. Now, there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world today. I believe that they, all those dogs came from a common pair of dogs on Noah's Ark. But that is nothing compared to what the evolutionists believe. They believe all those dogs in the world today came from a rock three billion years ago. So, let's just put this in perspective when we study this topic. So, anyway, who did Adam's sons marry? Well, the Bible says clearly Adam lived after he begat Seth 800 years and begat sons and daughters. Question, how many kids could you have in 800 years? <laughs> Several, right? A friend of mine in Arkansas had 13 kids in 13 years. I met a family in Minnesota with 20 kids, all under 20. It's cold in Minnesota. Oh. <laughs> anyway, so who did Adam's sons marry anyway? Well, in the first generation, they married sisters. You say, married sisters? Well, calm down. First place, there is no other choice, okay? Secondly, who would you report them to? Hmm? <laughs> Think about it. Thirdly, there were no laws against it until 2,500 years later when Moses gave the law. See, for the first 2,500 years of human history, it was not a problem marrying sisters. There were no deformed chromosomes. You wouldn't have any deformed children. See, everything about you is inherited. Even having children is hereditary. If your parents don't have any, you won't either. <laughs> you say, wow, I never thought of that. <laughs> Go think about it. You'll see I'm right. People say, you can't marry sisters. What about genetic similarity? Adam married his rib. You talk about genetic similarity. <laughs> it's not a problem, folks. Okay. Anyway, you won't notice this reading your Bible, but when you graph it out, you see some amazing things. Did you know that Adam lived long enough to know his great, 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 great grandson? Noah's daddy could have known Adam for 56 years. Can you imagine a family reunion back in those days? All right, everybody hop on the camel. We're going to go visit great, 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 great grandpa Adam. And great, 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 great grandpa Adam is going to tell us what it was like in the Garden of Eden before the first woman ate the first man out of house and home. <laughs> or whatever happened back then. Anyway, you also won't notice this reading your Bible, but Noah's son Shem lived a long time after the flood. Shem lived long enough to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, it's an interesting story here. Jacob had 13 kids. One of them was named Joseph. He's the one that got the coat in many colors. The brothers beat him up and threw him in the pit, and he ended up down in Egypt, and he became the vice pharaoh, or whatever they call him. Okay? And he invited the brothers to move down and live with him. And so Jake, Joseph is introducing his dad to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And he said, I'm 130. He said, but this is nothing. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, but have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers. What's he talking about? He says, I'm 130, but... This is nothing. Well, it's probably true when you consider he could have personally known Shem, Arphax, and Selah, and Eber. See, if you're 130, but you know a 600-year-old down the street, you just don't feel so old, okay? <laughs> anyway, here we got a clear problem. Now, folks, you talk about some clear lines. And I like the name of this conference, brother, Clear Lines. That's the way we ought to draw it. The textbook says the earth is billions of years old. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Somebody is wrong. So was Jesus lying? Did he not understand modern science, or was he right? How old is the earth anyway? Textbooks in your town and my town say the earth is billions of years old, millions of years ago. You see this on TV, it's in the magazines, it's all over the place. 
Billions and billions of years ago, we are bombarded with this propaganda. Even many Christians are teaching the earth is billions of years old. I debated Hugh Ross for three hours on the John Ankerberg show. He won't debate me again over the age of the earth question. I think this is an extremely important topic. Pat Robertson teaches it's billions of years old. The Navigator's Bible study group that helped lead me to the Lord teach the earth is billions of years old. John Hagee teaches the earth is billions of years old. People say, who cares? Well, this is an important topic because that teaching clearly puts death before sin. Now, I don't think it's a heresy to think the earth is billions of years old, but I do think it's a heresy to teach there was death before sin. That's against the clear teaching of the Bible. The Bible says death reigned from Adam to Moses. There was no death until Adam sinned. See, Adam brought death and suffering into this world. The Bible's real clear on this topic. Now, some people say, who cares? It's not that important. I, Hugh Ross says, well, it shouldn't be a divisive issue. Okay, agree with me, and it won't be divisive. <laughs> it's real simple, okay? For one thing, this issue is important because the credibility of Jesus Christ is at stake. Jesus quoted Genesis 25 times. So the question is, do we, ha can it, do we have to have a guru to tell us what the book means? Can we trust what Jesus said? Genesis itself clear clearly teaches that the earth was created in six days, about 6,000 years ago. Jesus said, creation of Adam was the beginning. Just about every other book in the Bible refers back to Genesis. This is an extremely important topic. This is the foundation. Now, the evolutionists really care about this topic because if you take away billions of years, their theory looks real silly. I think it looks real silly anyway, but it looks even sillier without their billions of years to hide in as a smoke screen, okay? Jesus said, had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. He wrote of me. And Moses clearly wrote the, at least the four books of the Pentateuch. He didn't write Genesis. He edited it. We'll get into that more on video number seven. Very interesting topic. But... There's all kinds of scientific ways also. Not only does the scripture teach the earth is 6,000 years old, and that's a clear line in the sand for me, the scientific evidence teaches the earth is not billions of years old. We're going to look at some of the limiting factors now for the age of the earth based on the scientific evidence. In 1999, they announced in the newspaper, last weekend the world's population topped the 6 billion mark. In 1985, there were 5 billion people on planet earth. In 1800, there were 1 billion people here. Just about everybody agrees, around the turn of 1800 century, there were about a billion people on planet Earth. There's just not much argument about this. And everybody agrees the population is growing rapidly. There's no argument there. But the world is not overcrowded. Don't fall for that overcrowded propaganda. The entire world's population today could fit inside the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida, where we are. This city where you guys live has 25 billion square feet. You could fit everybody in the world in here twice. The world's not overcrowded. Have you driven across Nebraska? <laughs> huh? Or Kansas? Or Wyoming? Or Montana? Drive across Texas. Anybody ever driven across Texas before? You can go for three days. Are we still in Texas? <laughs> yeah, you're still in, <laughs> still in Texas. Look, if it's overcrowded where you are, move. Okay? Because the rest of the world is not overcrowded. All right. I was out digging dinosaurs last summer in Colorado, and I said to this lady that owned the ranch, I said, ma'am, how big is your ranch? She said, she said it's 213,000 acres. I said, what's the property cost out here? She said, oh, about mm, $17 an acre. I was up in Barrow, Alaska, a couple of, uh, last September. Talk about north, that's as far as you can get. You get Arctic Ocean after that. We went up and touched it, of course, you know. I said, how many people live in this county? He said, well, this county is called a borough up here. It's the North Slope Borough. It is about twice the size of Ohio. It's about 50% bigger than the whole state of Florida. Just one county has a population of 10,000. I said, what's property cost up here? He said, cost? Come on up. I'll give it to you. <laughs> How much you want? <laughs> Back when Jesus was here, the population on planet Earth was about one quarter of a billion people. 250 million. There were lots of censuses done at that time. That's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. I mean, all the rulers tried to count their people so they could tax them, you know. Nothing's changed over the years. Um, so it's pretty well established that the population was about a quarter billion at the time of Christ, and it's now six billion. And if you plot the numbers on a graph, you can see it points clearly to the entire population starting about 4,400 years ago when eight people got off of Noah's Ark. Hmm. See, if you start with eight people having kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, you can get a population of five or six billion in a few thousand years. 
So if you believe in evolution, you've got a serious problem. Because you think man's been here for three million years. Do you realize in three million years the population would have grown? <laughs> right now there'd be 150,000 people per square inch. That would be crowded. Mm -hmm. See, God told him pretty clearly to replenish the earth, fill the earth, go have lots of kids. God, would, he designed the world to be inhabited. That's why he formed it, Isaiah 45 tells us. He formed it to be inhabited. He wants lots of people here. But Satan, of course, wants the opposite of what God wants. We've got people that work... Uh, that believe just the opposite of what the Lord wants, like Jacques Cousteau, who said, in order to stabilize world population, we need to eliminate 350,000 people a day. Nice guy, Jacques. <laughs> Ted Turner said we need a 95% decline in world population levels. Okay, Ted, you first. <laughs> there are some people who would like to reduce the population of this planet to one half billion as soon as possible. They think we're hurting Mother Earth. And there are some powerful folks. We cover much more on that on our seminar, on a college series. We'd offer our seminar in four different college classes, everything where we chased every rabbit and kicked every dog as we had no time constraints. But I get, get more on that on CSE 101. Anyway, the population tells us the Earth has not been here for billions of years. At least man hasn't. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in the future about these idiots reducing the population, you know, with chemtrails and all that. <laughs> we'll see. But... Uh, We'll cover more on that in video 7. The fact is, the population says it's not been billions of years. Actually, scientists are agreeing now that there is a genetic bottleneck sometime in man's past. This article said that based on the DNA studies, they're putting a bottleneck theory. There used to be, the whole, just about everybody was wiped out down to just a few people. And we all descended from just a few people on earth. Well, duh. <laughs> I even know the names of some of those people. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. <laughs> Yeah, there was a bottleneck. Did you know the galaxies up in the sky are spinning, but they're going different speeds. The stars in the galaxy are going different speeds. If the, the stars in the middle are going faster than the stars at the outside. If the galaxies were billions of years old, they would no longer have these spiral arms. The spiral arm galaxies are proof they are not billions of years old. So if somebody wants to believe they are, okay, you believe whatever you want, but it goes against the clear scientific evidence from the galaxies. They cannot be billions of years old. Stars blow up about every 25 to 30 years. If it's a little one, they call it a nova. If it's a big one, they call it a supernova, okay? But about every 25 or 30 years, a star explodes. Well, they search the heavens with the Hubble telescope, and they can only, not even find 300 supernova rings. Question, if the universe is billions of years old, why aren't there billions of supernova rings? Why less than 300? which would mean uh, less than 10,000 years. Mm hmm. Yeah. Some people say, well, new stars are forming in Crab Nebula. No, there is no evidence of new stars forming. There are some star spots getting brighter, and you can interpret that as new stars forming if you'd like, but it's not proof a new star is forming. Could be the dust is clearing and there's a star behind it. Any freshman law student could tear your argument apart in a court of law. Textbook says it takes billions of years for red stars to turn to white stars. That's what the books teach. That is simply not correct. We have overwhelming evidence that stars do change, that, you know, they fall apart, they burn out, they change from red stars to white stars. There seems to be pretty good evidence for that. But we also have evidence it does not take billions of years. All the ancient astronomers said Sirius was a red star. Everybody just 2,000 years ago was describing Sirius as redder than Mars, one of the red stars. Today, it's a white dwarf. We know what happens in less than 2,000 years. Don't tell me it takes millions of years. That's simply not correct. We have, see, one good experiment is worth a pound of theory any day. And we've got experimental evidence we can see and test and prove it doesn't happen that long. Some of the planets are still hot, but they're cooling off. They're radiating more heat than they gain from the sun. They can't be billions of years old. It's just not logical to say Jupiter, which is losing heat, is billions of years old. It just can't be. Jupiter has a little moon called Ganymede. Ganymede has a strong magnetic field. When it was discovered this, about this strong magnetic field, they said, wow, that's strange. That indicates a hot core, and yet Ganymede should have cooled off billions of years ago. I wonder why it still has such a strong magnetic field. Well, I can tell them why. You see, about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. Ganymede's not even 6,000 years old yet. Well, a few days older than that. It's real simple. Saturn has rings around it, but the rings are unstable, and they're, they're, they're moving away from the planet. 
There are all kinds of factors that are affecting the rings of Saturn. Gravitational poles and things like that. There's a good article about it in the book uh, by Walt Brown in the beginning. Saturn's rings cannot be billions of years old. That fits the biblical theory that everything was created about 6,000 years ago. Okay, the moon is going around the Earth. How many knew that already? The moon goes around the Earth. Okay. Did you know as the moon goes around, it's gradually getting farther away. We're slowly losing the moon. It's only a couple inches a year, about three inches a year, so it's no big deal. Nothing to worry about. Plus, there's nothing you can do about it anyway. Okay. <laughs> but the moon is getting farther from the Earth every year. Now, kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The moon is getting farther from the Earth every year. So that means that it used to be closer. <laughs> How many can figure this out? Now stay with me, okay? All right. Well, if you bring the moon in closer, you start to create a problem because the moon causes the tides. Now, you folks in Jacksonville probably have to worry about the tides, don't you? If a hurricane hits during high tide, you've got a serious problem on your hand. Well, if you brought the moon in closer, the tides would be higher because of a law known as the inverse square law. If you brought the moon in to one-third the distance, you take the one-third, inverse it, and square it, it's nine times the gravitational pull. And if you run all the math on this, you'll find out about 1.2 billion years ago, the moon was whizzing around just above the surface of the earth. Now, way before that, you're going to have a serious tide problem. So that explains what happened to the tall dinosaurs. They got mooned. <laughs> comets are flying around through space, but comets are constantly losing material. That's what the tail is blowing off of a comet. It's losing part of itself, okay? You can't just keep losing and losing. Pretty soon, it's gone. You know, it's kind of like your checkbook. See, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall every single time. Well, these comets are losing material, and it's been estimated they can't last more than about 10,000 years. Okay, well, then I have a question. If the Earth is billions of years old, and if the universe is billions of years old, why do we still have comets? I mentioned this in a seminar one time, that this is an evidence that the universe is not billions of years old, just the very existence of comets, like Halley's Comet. It proves it's not billions of years old. And this one atheist went home and devoted an entire website against me. There are now over 1,000 anti-Hovind websites. <laughs> Type in Kent Hovind on the search engine and watch your computer melt. <laughs> they hate me out there. So we spent about two months here uh, last year, and we developed a series called Dr. Hovind Answers His Critics. And we answer all the stuff that they say on the websites on a video. You can get on video or DVD or audio track if you'd like, or CD if you want to listen to it as you drive. I give an answer to some of the stuff they're, they're criticizing on there. But one of these atheists on his website, but, or you can also listen into my radio program. Go to Dr. Dino, my website, and go to the Creation Science Hour. We do a daily radio broadcast for an hour. Anybody calls, anyone, anybody from all over the world can call, and we get them from all over. And they ask questions. We have atheists call in and get angry and stuff like that. So that's what it's for. I want to be accessible to be able to answer questions because I'm going to defend the Bible view against all comers. Anyway, the skeptic on his website said, Hoven, don't you know that a Dutch astronomer named Jan Ort proposed, that means he hoped, he wished, he prayed, that there was a shell of comets out there at the remote frontiers of the solar system. He said the reason we still have comets is because new ones keep coming in from the Oort cloud. Hmm. That's his theory, okay? He said this Oort cloud is 50,000 astronomical units away. Well, for those who don't know what an astronomical unit is, that is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That is one astronomical unit, 93 million miles. Did you know it's pretty hard to see Pluto without an excellent telescope? And Pluto is only 39 astronomical units away. You certainly could not see a comet 50,000 astronomical units away. You see, nobody has ever seen the Oort cloud. Oort never saw the Oort cloud. <laughs> the whole thing's based on a mathematical mistake. There is no Oort cloud. We got even guys like Carl Pagan, uh, Sagan, who said, he said, many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution, yet there's not a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. <laughs> they, they know all about it, except they've never seen it and don't know anything about it. There is no Oort cloud. But this skeptic, Matt Madsen, on his website said, Fellas, if you want to use the comet argument, it's up to you to prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the Oort cloud and other sources don't exist. He's saying, i got to prove the Oort cloud doesn't exist. Now, just hold on a minute, Dave. That's not the way science works. What he's trying to do here is called shifting the burden of proof. 
The liberals are really good at doing that, and we fall for it most of the time. I'll show you how easy it is to shift the burden of proof. Suppose I said, watermelons are blue on the inside until you cut the skin. Prove I'm wrong. <laughs> That'd be tough to do, wouldn't it? See, if all I have to do is make up a story and you've got to prove it's wrong, I can keep you busy the rest of your life. And he's trying to make up a story that there's an oort cloud and saying, I have to prove it doesn't exist. How on earth would you prove the non-existence of anything? <laughs> Wouldn't you have to be all places at all times to prove anything doesn't exist? They, could, they can't find Osama bin Laden. Does that prove he doesn't exist? <laughs> uh, duh. <laughs> the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Everything in the universe tells us God designed it. You know, the evolution theory has the sun and stars evolving before the earth. The Bible says he made the earth before the sun and stars. Very clearly different. Actually, there are many differences. Between the evolution theory and the creation theory, everything is backwards. It's opposite. And we got these Christians trying to blend the two together. I say, duh, you guys, your Bible says exactly the opposite of what the evolution theory says. You know, the Bible has the fish coming before the insects. Evolution has insects evolving before fish. The Bible has plants coming before the sun was made. Evolution has the sun coming and then the plants. Most important difference, number 11, the Bible says man brought death into the world. Evolution says death brought man into the world. Total opposite, folks. Somebody's wrong. There is no compromise in this battle. Somebody's wrong. People say, couldn't God use evolution to create? Well, it's not the God of the Bible. The God that would need to use an evolutionary process is cruel and wasteful and retarded. <laughs> it's not the God the Bible teaches about. I wouldn't worship a God like that. Doesn't he know what he wants? Can't he just make it right in six days? Poof! Or six seconds. Why does your God have to practice and play around? You ought to trade your God in for a real one. But I, yeah. The psalmist said, when I consider thy heavens. Hey kids, he says when, not if. You would do yourself a favor to shut off that TV once in a while and go outside and consider what God has made. The psalmist said, while I was musing, the fire burned. The word muse is used twice in the Bible. It means to think. Think. Now, English is a pretty cool language. A theist is a person who believes in God. If you put the letter A in front of a word, it means the opposite of. So an atheist is a person who claims he does not believe in God. Okay? Muse means to think. Ah, muse literally means to not think. That is the meaning of the word. They've got entire parks where you can actually pay money and go do that. They're called amusement parks. That's exactly correct. Okay. The psalmist said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, it's interesting. A person that spends his time considering what God has done is not impressed with what man can do. And parents, some of you ought to go home and look in your kid's bedroom. And if what you see plastered all over the wall are pictures of sports heroes, think carefully now. You're training your kids to meditate on what man can do. They're not meditating on what God has done. And you're going to raise a very shallow thinker in your house. The depth of his understanding is going to be, wow, he threw the ball through the hoop. Oh, and who is going to care in 40 years? Who's going to care in five years? Does anybody know who won the stupid bowl? I mean, the Super Bowl uh, 10 years ago? Anybody know who won 10 years ago? Does anybody care? It doesn't matter, does it? All those grown men out there fighting over that one ball, and they can all afford to go buy their own. I don't think it's sinful. I think it's just stupid to pay a guy $5 million to carry a pig bladder down a cow pasture. I don't think there's any common sense to that at all, okay? <laughs> you ought to go outside and consider what God has made. You know, the most recent estimate is there's enough stars out there that everybody on planet Earth can own 11 trillion of them to yourself. 70 sextillion stars is the current estimate. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. <laughs> they asked the Hubble telescope to focus in on a dot. They thought they found a black spot in space about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. The Hubble focused on that spot for 10 days, took a bunch of pictures. When they put them all together, they said, man, there are more stars there than we can count. These are ones we didn't know about before. Amazing universe God built. The Bible says, speak to the earth and it shall teach thee. The earth is like a big magnet. 
Now, magnets always lose their strength. The Earth's magnet has lost 10% of its strength in the last 150 years. Well, that's normal for magnets to lose their strength, but that's interesting. That proves the Earth is not more than 25,000 years old. This is a limiting factor. Because if you go backwards in time, the magnetic field was stronger, and at some point it becomes too strong for life to exist here because of the heat generated, among other things. It also proves carbon dating can't work because carbon dating is directly proportional to the magnetic field because as the magnetic field declines, more radiation gets in, and that's what forms carbon-14. We cover more on that in video 7. But in 1949, when they first invented carbon dating, the leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old, but the skin from the same mammoth dated 21,000 years old. <laughs> Didn't work. And it got worse as time went along. 1975, one part of a mammoth was 29,000 years old, another part's 44,000 from the same animal. Cover much more on video 7 about that. Uh, or on our website, drdino.com, if you want more on carbon dating. Um, the textbook says, well, yes, Hoven, the magnetic field is declining, but that's because it's part of a pattern of reversals. It's getting ready to reverse. The magnetic field is declining, and it's going to flip over. Nobody has a clue how it even could reverse. There is no proof it ever has, and there are no magnetic reversals locked in the, in the, in the, in the ocean floor. What we've observed for 150 years is the magnetic field is declining. That's observable science. The rest is purely theoretical. Actually, there's an interesting article in the, in the beginning book, Walt Brown's book, about the magnetic reversal mythology here. It's a matter of stronger and weaker magnetism, not magnetic reversals. As this is all part of another theory called Pangea. How many have ever heard of Pangea theory before? They say all the continents used to fit together. I get asked this question every week. Hey, Hovind, do you think all the continents used to fit together? I say, well, they didn't tell you they shrank Africa nearly 40% to make them fit, did they? I bet they didn't tell you they took out all of Mexico and Central America. Hey, Señor, ¿qué pasa? ¿Dónde está Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala? And they also, they don't tell you what I think ought to be obvious to a kindergartner. Did you know if you take the water out of the oceans, there is dirt underneath? Hmm? People say, do you think the continents were connected? I say, what do you mean were? They still are. <laughs> Hello? It's not hollow under the oceans, you know. <laughs> it's just the low places are full of water, that's all. Uh, duh. <clears throat> we cover more on the Pangea theory on videotape number six of our series. What a dumb theory. Um, the Earth is spinning about 1,000 miles an hour, 1,041.6 for you technical folks, at the equator. But the Earth is slowing down. It actually is slowing down enough to create a problem. Every year to year and a half, they have to add a second to the clock because the earth is slowing down. They call it a leap second. 1990, Pensacola News Journal said, we have to add a tick to the clock because the earth's rotation is slowing down. It says regular clocks use days as a measure which are going longer by a thousandth of a second or more daily as earth's rotation slows. 1992, Astronomy Magazine said, Earth's rotation is slowing down. June will be one second longer than normal. We will have a leap second. Leap second. Did you know we have a leap second about every year to year and a half? Because the Earth is slowing down. Now kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The Earth is spinning, but it is slowing down. So that means that it used to be going faster. <laughs> How many can figure this out now with no help? Okay. Well now, if the earth is only 6,000 years old, this is no problem. It was going a little faster when Adam was here. He wouldn't notice. He didn't have a watch anyway, as far as we know. But some of these guys want me to believe the earth is billions of years old. Man, if you go back billions of years, the world was spinning real fast. <laughs> Your days and nights would be pretty quick. Get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed. <laughs> You never get nothing done. <clears throat> the centrifugal force would have been enormous. The winds would have been 5,000 miles an hour from the Coriolis effect. And you think dinosaurs lived 200 million years ago? Oh, I know what happened to them. <laughs> they got blown off. No, they did not live 200 million years ago. The Sahara Desert has what's called a prevailing wind pattern. The wind almost always blows the same way. This creates a problem. The hot air blows off the desert and kills the trees next door, and that area becomes desert. The process is called desertification. Well, now, they've done quite a bit of study on Sahara that's pretty obvious it is growing. There's just no question about that. But they said, after studying it for years, they said, you know, the Sahara Desert is probably about 4,000 years old. 
Okay, I, I have no reason to doubt that, but I do have a question. If the Sahara is only 4,000 years old, why don't we have a bigger desert someplace? Why would the biggest desert on earth be less than 4,000 years old? Well, I have a theory about that. Now, here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. It's pretty hard to have a desert under a flood. Hmm, right? So the desert couldn't start growing until the flood water went down. So I predict, based on the Bible, the biggest desert in the world will be less than 4,400 years old. <laughs> it is. <laughs> wow. Maybe the Bible's right. Did you know when they drill into the ground, sometimes they hit oil? The oil's oftentimes under incredible pressure, like 20,000 pounds per square inch. It'll come squirting up out of the ground, poof, like a big zit. 20,000 PSI. Well, the guys who study this problem say, you know, the, the oil has some pressure simply because of the rocks on top of it. It's called the overlying weight of the rock, the overburden. That produces pressure. But the oil pressure is greater than the weight of overbearing rock. So this should have cracked the rock and equalized the pressure in less than 10,000 years. Okay, well, if all that's true, then I have a question. Why do we still have oil pressure? Actually, where did the oil come from? Well, most scientists agree, and I agree with them, that oil comes from organisms that are squished. They're changed by heat and pressure into oil. Clear back in 1970, they learned, 71, they learned how to make oil in 30 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes in the laboratory. In 1996, they set up a factory in Australia to turn sewage sludge into oil in 30 minutes. They opened up a factory in Texas a couple years ago, can turn almost anything to oil. They're taking turkey guts and turning it into oil with heat and pressure. Check it out, Discover Magazine, May of 2003. Sinclair Gas Company has the dinosaur as their logo. They say dinosaurs turn to oil. Yes, boys and girls, these dinosaurs, dinosaurs mellowed for 80 million years. I don't think so. I have a theory about the oil, and here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. In that flood, lots of critters and people drowned. And they got covered up by the gravel and the rocks and the mud and the sand, and it got pretty heavy after a while, and it squished them <coughs> into oil. So the oil's down there today from the people and animals that drowned in that flood. Which means if you stop and think about that, you drove over here today on some of your ancestors. <laughs> Next time you're pumping them in there, you can say, Bye, Grandpa. You, sh <laughs> you should have listened to Noah. <laughs> he told you it was going to rain. You should have got on that boat. Hmm? Yeah. I was preaching in Denver, Colorado one time, and some guys came to the meeting, and they said, uh, Hoven, uh, can we talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. After the meeting, we talked, and they said, now look, you know, we know that you go around teaching the earth is 6,000 years old. Uh, we'd like to prove you're wrong. Would you come with us, please? I said, sure. These guys worked at the National Ice Core Laboratory just outside of Denver. They said, we go to, the Green to Greenland and to the South Pole, and we drill holes through the ice. Government job, you know. Uh, and we save the center part of the hole. Oh, we need more ice, that's for sure. We're running out of ice. We'll spend a billion dollars, go to Greenland and get some. Uh, well, they drill these holes down in the ice. They take what's called a core sample. Here's a picture of the coring machine. This thing drills down and snaps off a six to ten foot section of ice and pulls it up out of the hole. And they said, we want to show you these ice cores, Mr. Hovind. Come on in the freezer. They took me in this massive freezer they've got there, about as big as this auditorium, 36 below zero in there. And they took these ice cores out of their styrofoam tubes and laid one on the table and said, now see this ice core here? I said, yep. They said, you see the rings on there? It looks like tree rings, dark and light and dark and light. I said, oh yeah, they're very clear. Interesting. They said, now Hovind, in the summer, it, the snow melts just a little bit on top and then it refreezes and makes clear ice, which shows up dark here on the picture. In the winter, it packs the snow and it makes white ice. So what we have here are examples of summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. Just like annual rings of a tree. I said, okay. They said, now the deepest hole we ever drilled is 10,000 feet. And we counted 135,000 annual rings. And here you are claiming the earth is 6,000 years old. Hoven, you're wrong. I said, now fellas, aren't you assuming those are annual rings? See, apparently they didn't know about the Lost Squadron, but some airplanes ran out of gas during World War II and landed in Greenland. How many have ever heard of the Lost Squadron? It's been on TV a couple times. Go to thelostsquadron.com and see all about it. Well, a rich man from Kentucky got a brilliant idea to go over there and get those airplanes off the ice. 
brand new World War II airplanes sitting there on the ice. He said, hey, let's brush off the snow, gas them up, and fly them home. Well, it wasn't quite that easy. They had to find them using ground-penetrating radar because the airplanes were under 263 feet of ice in 48 years. They melted a hole down to get to one of them, a P-38, and took it apart and brought all the pieces up through the hole. They call it cold mining with a hot tube they ran water through called the gopher. They melted a hole down there, took the airplane apart, brought the pieces up through the hole, and put it back together in Middleboro, Kentucky. It flew a couple years ago for the first time in nearly 50 years. Now, when they melted down to get to the airplane, they went through ice rings. Interesting. Airplanes were in the ground for 48 years. They were 263 feet down. Those are historical scientific facts, okay? That's five and a half feet a year worth of ice accumulating on top of those planes. You had 10,000 feet is the deepest hole they ever drilled. You divide that by five and a half and you get 1,800 years, not 135,000. Now, deeper layers get squished, I understand. The pressure changes it to fern, F-I-R-N. I understand that. I taught her science for years. So really, 4,400 is no problem. 4,400 years is no problem to account for all the ice at the North and South Pole. Well, I went up and visited the airport where they're putting this thing together. I got to talk to the guy who helped dig it out. His name is Bob Carden. There's his picture and his phone number right there. Call him if you don't believe me. I said, Bob, when you melted down to get to that airplane, did you go through ice rings? He said, oh, yes, many hundreds of them. I said, how could there be hundreds of annual rings in 48 years? Shouldn't there be like maybe, you know, 48? He said, annual rings? He said, those aren't annual rings. He said, that doesn't represent summer, winter, summer, winter. It represents warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. You can get five of those in one week around here, can't you? Yeah. But here's a Scientific American article where the guy is still calling them annual layers. Now, folks, either he's confused or he's, he's, he's under-informed of the topic or he's deliberately lying. He may just be ignorant, okay? I hope that's the case because ignorance can be fixed. Stupid is forever, but <laughs> ignorance can be fixed, all right? That's the difference, by the way. The guy that works with the Eskimos sent me this postcard and said, Brother Hoven, uh, I work with the Eskimos in Alaska. He said they've got over 40 words for snow up here, different types of snow. He said, I got 18 or 15 layers of snow on my car in eight hours. Not 15 inches, 15 layers of snow. Those layers are not different ages, not a year apart. Same thing with the textbook when they tell the kids about the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic. How many have ever heard of the geologic column before? We cover much more on that on video four. The geologic column is a joke. It doesn't exist any place on planet Earth except in the textbooks. Get our video number four for more on that. Those layers are not different ages. All over the world, petrified trees have been found standing up, connecting these layers. Now, they're telling us these layers are different ages, and yet we've got petrified trees connecting them. I'm sorry, you're mistaken. The layers are not different ages. They all formed in one flood, and it doesn't take long for things to petrify. They can, things can petrify quickly. Here's a piece of petrified firewood. I've got a petrified pickle in my museum in Pensacola. The lid to the jar rusted off and the pickle turned to stone inside the jar. We got the jar and the pickle. Come on up and see it. One kid sent me a bag of petrified acorns with a little note. He said, Brother Hovind, I put these acorns in the water to hope they would sprout, and I forgot about them. Ten years old, you know. Next spring, my mom found the bucket on the back porch and said, Son, get rid of these acorns. He said, In less than a year, they turned to stone. I've got them in the museum. Stop and see our dinosaur adventure land in Pensacola, Florida. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. It doesn't take millions of years to give birth, praise God, okay? <laughs> There's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's leg still in it. It's on the table now. There's an article about it. It's called The Limestone Cowboy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, we cover more on that on videotape number six about petrification. Uh, the Mississippi River is depositing sediments at the rate of 80,000 tons every hour. 80,000 tons of mud comes down the Mississippi and dumps off in New Orleans. That delta is growing larger and larger and larger. There's no question there's a lot of mud coming down that river. They call it the muddy Mississippi. And there's no question the delta is growing. But it's interesting, after studying the delta carefully, they've drilled holes all over that thing looking for oil under it, you know. Their estimate, current estimate is that the delta has about 30,000 years worth of mud out there. Okay, well then I have a question. If the earth is millions of years old, why isn't the whole Gulf of Mexico full of mud by now? Mm -hmm. 
They're going to say, hey, Hoven is 30,000 years. That proves your Bible's wrong. Your Bible says 6,000. Well, no, I, I got a theory about that delta. Now, here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. And as the flood water was running off, whoosh, about half of that mud went out there in 20 minutes. So it looks like it took 30,000 years. They forgot the flood. That'll mess them up every time. A friend of mine from Louisiana is a, his pastor of a church now, but he said, Brother Hovind, I used to drill for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. He said, we drilled through 14,000 feet of mud and hit trees 60 feet tall, under 14,000 feet of mud. Folks, most of that mud was washed out in a big catastrophe called the flood. Here's a picture of the oldest tree in the world. The oldest living tree is a bristlecone pine in Southern California. Estimates of the age of the tree vary from 4,300 to 4,700. This textbook says 4,300 years old is the oldest organism. Now, the fact is, trees don't always produce one ring a year. They can produce two rings a year. Okay? One guy said in a seminar, I had a Q&A session. He said, Mr. Oven, you're exactly right. He said, I'm a professional wood carver. I've done it for 40 years. He said, I plant my own trees and carve them, make walking sticks for people, expensive walking sticks, you know, for rich people who can pay a thousand bucks for one or whatever. He said, we grow our trees for seven years, cut them down. They always have at least 11 rings in seven years. That's what he told me. He said, I've been doing it for 40 years. Anyway, this textbook says the oldest tree is 4,300 years old. Now, that's interesting. I have a question. If the earth is billions of years old, uh, why don't we have an older tree someplace? Why would the oldest tree on earth be 4,300 years old? Well, I have a theory about that. Here's my theory. I believe 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. Wrecked everything. So the oldest tree ought to be less than uh, 4,400 years old. Amen. It is. Here's a picture of a coral reef. You know, the largest reef in the world is off the coast of Australia. It's called the Great Barrier Reef. I had a call from a church in Brisbane. They said, do you want to come preach over here? I said, I need to pray about this. He said, yes. <laughs> I took my whole family to Australia. My daughter and I got to go scuba diving at the Great Barrier Reef. It was incredible. During World War II, some of the reef was destroyed by ships and anchors and bombs and stuff like that. So the environmentalist wackos went out there to see how fast it grows back. They watched the reef grow for 20 years. It was a government project. Based on a 20-year study, they said the reef is less than 4,200 years old. Oh, okay. Well, then I have a question. If the earth is millions of years old, why don't we have a bigger reef someplace? Why would the biggest reef on earth be less than 4,200 years old? I have a theory about that. <laughs> I, I bet you know what it is, don't you? You can figure it out. Okay. Here's a picture of Niagara Falls. The textbook says, boys and girls, the rocky ledge above Niagara Falls has been eroding for 9,900 years. Now, how do they know that? Well, it's pretty interesting. The rocks are breaking off the edge. All waterfalls do that. You know, the water rocks break off the edge, and the waterfall eats its way backwards. The water flows one way, the waterfall moves the other way in response to the erosion. They've studied Niagara Falls pretty carefully for the last 200 years. They say it's moving back 4.7 feet a year. Interesting. Well, when Charlie Lyle went there in 1840, he said Niagara Falls is obviously back here, and it quite obviously started up here by Lewiston, New York. It's moving back down the gully. Charlie Lyle said, I think it took 10,000 years to go that far. Now, he said that purposely to try to discredit the Bible. Charlie Lyle hated the Bible. And that's the book that destroyed the faith of Charles Darwin. We get into more of that on videotape number four. But Lyle, the people, he said it took 10,000 years. The people that lived there said, hey, it erodes much faster than that. But he didn't listen to him. He had his theory. He had his agenda to push, okay? He wanted to discredit the scriptures. Now, the fact is, the water goes over the falls into a gorge called the Niagara Gorge. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. That gorge is seven and a half miles long. All right, this textbook says a simple calculation shows it's been 9,900 years worth of erosion. Well, it's not quite that simple, okay? You see, Niagara Falls is right here. It used to be further north by Lewiston. It's moving south, quite obviously, because the water flows north. I got a question now. If the earth is millions of years old, why hasn't it eroded all the way back to Lake Erie? Why is Niagara Falls right there? Well, I have a theory about that. 
Here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. As the flood water was running off, whoosh, about half of that gully washed out in 20 minutes. So it looks like it took 9,900 or 40, 9,900 years by the textbook. No, they forgot the flood. They also forgot to get the right numbers, okay? So if they had divided right, it would have been 8,400 using the 4.7. But, you know, public school textbook, what do you expect? Okay. Um, when it rains, 30% of the water runs into the ocean. The rest evaporates or soaks into the ground. Well, as it runs into the ocean, it brings with it mineral salts off the ground. It washes salts off the ground called mineral salts. The oceans are getting saltier every day because of the distillation process of sunlight evaporating water out and, you know, minerals washing in and water coming out. The minerals don't come out, just the water. Today, the oceans are 3.6% salt. They could have done that in less than 5,000 years. I was in a debate one time, and this atheist said, Hovind, would you please tell me how the freshwater fish survived Noah's flood? I said, well, sir, aren't you assuming the flood was salt water? He said, the ocean is salt water. I said, well, yeah, it is today. <laughs> I think during the flood, it's probably mostly fresh water. He said, well, how did the salt water fish survive? I said, well, there probably weren't any. He said, the ocean is full of salt water creatures. I said, well, yeah, it is today. I said, I think what happened over the last 40, 400 years, some animals have gradually become adapted to salt water. And today we have freshwater alligators and freshwater crocodiles and saltwater crocodiles. And they probably had a common ancestor, a crocodile. <laughs> he said, that's evolution. I said, oh, it is not. Going from a freshwater croc to a saltwater croc is a minor change compared to what you believe. So you believe they changed from a rock to a croc. Now, there's a major change for you folks. Yes, sir. How many of you have ever gone into a cave and the guide said, don't touch the formations. They take millions of years to form. They all have the same story, right? You go to Carlsbad, they'll say, yep, it took 250 million years to make these formations in here. They say tiny drops of water slowly build these formations. One guy said it takes a thousand years to grow from one-tenth of a centimeter to ten centimeters, up to two and a half inches. Maximum be two and a half inches per thousand years. Well, I don't think so. Here are some 50 inch long stalactites growing under the Lincoln Memorial, built 1922. Here's a bat covered up with flowstone before it could rot. It doesn't take millions of years for that stuff to form. Here's two inch stalactites growing off a refrigeration shed in Pensacola, Florida. There's a building in Indiana. It's only 40 years old. The basement is full of huge flowstone formations in 40 years from water dripping through the limestone. There's a mine in Australia that was closed down for 55 years. When they opened it up to just check to see how it's doing, there were huge cave formations that formed in 55 years. There are two people inside that circle to give you an idea how big this is. There's a pipe that was dripping water up at Herbert Field near Pensacola at Eglin Air Force Base. Made a 13-inch stalactite in seven years. Underneath on the ground was a stalagmite. Everybody kept tripping on it, and so they broke it off and gave it to me. It's in my museum. Stalagmite formed in seven years. Here's a parking garage in Texas. Brand new parking garage built in 1997. It was making stalagmites on students' cars parking under it, so they put up a drip pan to catch the water. <coughs> a guy in Wyoming had a hot mineral spring on his property in Thermopolis, Wyoming, and so he stuck a pipe in the ground back in 1903. The water came out the top of the pipe, ran down the sides. They called it the teepee fountain, kind of a natural fountain. Everybody thought, wow, that's cute. He's got a fountain in his yard. Well, slowly over the years, the water, as it ran down the side of the pipe, evaporated, some of it, leaving behind mineral deposits. How many have seen those mineral deposits in your sink, okay? Well, the guy died, and they left the pipe sticking in the yard. It's now been there for 100 years. Here it is, about six years ago. That would take some lime away to scrub that clean, don't you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure would. It does not take millions of years to form those things. That's 100 years worth. The guy down the street started one later. It's not quite as big. But folks, it doesn't take a long time. Did you know at the current rate of erosion, the continents are going to erode flat in 14 million years? We have mudslides, landslides, of course, erosion, abrasion, exfoliation. Does the ground ever fall up? It's always down, isn't it? Sedimentary rock's always on its way down anyway. You might get igneous rock coming up, volcanoes. Did you know, they're telling us we've got fossils in sedimentary rock that are 300 times older than the current erosion rate would allow for. Hmm. 
All you got to do is fly out west. Two days ago, I flew back from Grand Canyon, flew out west. You just look out the window of the plane, folks. It looks like there's erosion marks every place down there in places that hardly ever rain. We cover Grand Canyon in video four also. If you think that river made that canyon, you need to watch video number four. Um, erosion marks all over this world are evidence of massive flooding on this planet. And we could spend all day on that. We cover more in video six. A couple more things and we'll quit. The oldest writings in the world are about 5,000 years old. Well, that's interesting. Why would the oldest writings be 5,000 years old? Why does the Chinese calendar say this is the year 4704 right now? They think they started with Noah. The Chinese calendar, or the Hebrew calendar, said this is the year 5764. They think they started with Adam with their calendar. Don't trust the Egyptian calendar, by the way. That one's greatly exaggerated. Get the book Evolution Cruncher, a 900-page book for five bucks. Go to our website. It's a great book with lots of good stuff on evolution. Why would the oldest reliable historical records be less than 6,000 years old? I have a theory about that. I think the Bible is absolutely correct. I think the evidence for a young earth is overwhelming. The evidence for an old earth is minimal. And like the coins in the box, you have to go by the limiting factors. Each one of the evidences for a young earth would have to be overcome. Each single one would stand independently. Students are never shown the idea, though, that the earth might be young. I think I know why. This isn't really a science book anymore. It's a book about evolution. Somebody wants to make sure your kids believe that theory because it's part of a much bigger long-range plan toward a new world order. There's a reason for this. The founding fathers started this country said, We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain rights. Where do rights come from? Well, they come from the creator. And if you get a bunch of people together who believe they have rights that come from the Creator, those people do not make good slaves. They will actually throw the tea in the harbor and start a big war. <laughs> they will. Now, if you want to have a one-world government, a new world order like some of these lunatics would like to have, and like is prophesied in the Bible, they're going to get it. You can't have people believing in creation. So they've been working really hard for the last hundred years to take over the school system where they only teach this evolution theory which says rights come from government. Rights don't come from the Creator because there is no Creator. It ties into many things. We cover more on that on video five. For example, do you have the right to have a church? The government says in the Internal Revenue Code 501c3 that you, you can ask to be a, an exemption to the tax laws if you'd like. And most churches do that. They file papers to become a corporation, which is a creature of the state, and then they become 501c3 exempt. But they admitted a couple pages later in Internal Revenue Code 508 that churches are an exception. Why would you give up an exception status to become an exemption? <laughs> Think about it. There's more on that on the website hushmoney.org. Same thing with marriage. Why do you ask the state for permission to get marriage? Who gives the right to get married? Well, that's another long story. We covered that in our college class. But, but you know, 75% of the kids that go to public schools are going to lose their faith after one year of college. 75%. That's what happened to Crawford Toy. Most of you have probably never heard of Crawford Toy. Crawford Toy was a brilliant Bible scholar. He worked with the Southern Baptist Convention in the eight, late 1800s. He loved the Lord and loved the Bible. He was a professor at the, at the Southern Baptist Seminary. You might know about the girl he almost married. He just about married a girl named Lottie Moon. How many have ever heard of Lottie Moon before? Every year the Southern Baptists have the Lottie Moon offering. Well, Crawford went to Europe and studied evolution after the Civil War. He came back convinced the theory was true. He told his class, he said, the Bible intends to teach a plain six-day creation. The Bible is simply in error at that point. Uh, the Bible's in error? Crawford, maybe your theory's in error. Maybe you have been brainwashed. Uh, folks, it is very easy to get brainwashed. I'm going to try to brainwash the entire crowd here tonight. And then we're going to quit, take some break, and have some question and answer time. I'm going to tell you a little story. As I tell the story, I will brainwash you. Maybe you've never been brainwashed before. It's okay. It's a harmless procedure, right? When I'm done brainwashing you, I will ask you two questions about the story. If you know the answer, it's probably because you saw my video before. 
If you don't know the answer, it's because you were successfully brainwashed. Now, pay attention, watch carefully, here goes the story. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men and why did he leave home jogging? If you know for sure, don't say it out loud, just raise your hand. Six, seven, eight, about twelve, okay? The rest of you, pay attention. Let's try it again. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. I'll give you a hint, that's important. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways, turned left, and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men? And why did he leave home jogging? Anybody new figured out? Four more. Okay, the rest of you, pay attention. We're going to try it again. Now I'm going to unbrainwash you. Now watch carefully. I'll tell the same story and you'll feel yourself get unbrainwashed in a few seconds. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways, turned left, and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men were waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men, and why did he leave home jogging? Uh, the catcher in the umpire, and he hit a home run. <laughs> you say, Brother Hovind, is it that easy to get brainwashed? Yep. You see, as soon as I said a man left home, you started thinking about a house, right? And for the rest of the story, you could not figure out who those two masked men were. If you get somebody off track in the first few seconds, it's real tough to get back on track. Would you like to see how thousands of kids get brainwashed in Duval County every year? Thousands of them. Right here in the middle of the Bible Belt. The kid goes to kindergarten. Maybe some kid out of your house, maybe one of your children goes to kindergarten. And he gets a book like this. I can read about dinosaurs. Would anybody like to just take a wild guess at what the first sentence in the book says? <laughs> Millions of years ago. Do you think there's any books like this in your school system? Do you think there's any books like this in your public library? you think the kids are going to hear this stuff on Nature Channel, Steve Irwin, Crocodile Hunter, Discovery Channel, National Geographic? Of course they are. Dr. Seuss. Millions of years before you were born. It's everywhere, folks. I go to museums all the time. I am sick and tired of all the museums teaching evolution. So we started our own, a creation museum. Come visit Pensacola, Florida. When they say the earth is millions of years old, that's calling Jesus a liar. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Do you realize we got Christians that teach their kids, we have death in the world because of man's sin. And then they read them a story about dinosaurs dying before man got here. Hello, have you thought about the inconsistency in your logic? Well, we cover more on that in other series, seminar series, but the Bible says they lived to be 900 years old before the flood. How's that possible? Well, we cover that on video number two. How on earth did they live to be 900? What was that Garden of Eden like? What was it like before the flood? We cover that on seminar part two. And you can watch our seminars right online. And what about dinosaurs? Didn't dinosaurs live millions of years ago? Uh, no. Dinosaurs lived with Adam and Eve. We cover that on video number three, all about dinosaurs. But listen, somebody's going to teach your kids. You started like a slime and you slowly evolved to a human. That teaching is going to destroy their whole philosophy of life. The Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. If a kid goes 12 to 16 years to school in your school system, how is he going to view the world? Now look, I'm not against schools, I'm not against teachers. My brother led me to the Lord. He's been a public school teacher for 34 years. My mom was a public school teacher and retired years ago. She's been in heaven for 10 years now. I'm not against the schools, I'm not against teachers, but folks, the books teach something that's going to destroy your kids' philosophy. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He says He did it in six days. You know, if the Bible's right about the beginning, uh, maybe it's right about the end also. Mm -hmm. Let's summarize here and we'll quit. God made this world. He owns it. He makes the rules. 
And every one of us is guilty of breaking His rules. He told us pretty clearly in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't tell a lie. How many of you have ever told a lie in your life? Come on, put your hand up. You're doing another one. I don't want to hear this pious, not me. <laughs> okay. The Bible says, Thou shalt not steal. How many ever stole something? Come on, you already told me you're a liar. Put your hand up, okay? <laughs> all right, so far we know we're all a bunch of lying thieves, right? <laughs> Do you want to read the whole list and see how, see how we're doing? We're 0 for 2 so far. We better stop right there. There is no question on Judgment Day, when Judgment Day comes, we are going to be found guilty. No question. Which means we're going to be punished. Or you better find a substitute. And that's where Jesus comes in. Praise God. Jesus has volunteered to pay for your sins. Not because you're good, but because you need it. <laughs> you're bad, okay? But He loves you. He wants to forgive you. These deer figured out if they get in the river, the fire goes right past them. It's pretty smart thinking. Hey, did you know if you're in Christ, the judgment's going to go right past you? I deserve God's judgment, but I'm not going to get it. I'm in Christ. That's amazing. What if some of these idiots do reduce the population of the planet? What if we're all dead this year? You're going to die someday. Where are you going to go? If you died today, where would you go? That's an important question because you're going to be dead for a really long time. I don't care how long you live, you will be dead longer than that. George Washington died 205 years ago and he is still dead. Where are you going when you die? All you get is that little tiny dash between two dates. Someday there's going to be a rock with your name on it. Could be this week. You could die tonight. Have you seen the way they drive out here? <laughs> Got some rednecks on the highway, folks. I'm telling you what. You can get killed this evening. <laughs> I'm going to die someday. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do, but it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen to you too. Okay. Where are you going? You're going to be there for a long time. If you're not sure you're saved, what you need to do is very simple. You need to say, Lord, I confess I have sinned. I have broken your laws. I'm guilty. Don't go before God and say, hey, I'm pretty good. You better take me. <laughs> he, he's not impressed, okay? You're lying. You're not very good. Admit it. Lord, I'm a sinner. And Lord, I have violated your laws. I have broken your laws. I'm guilty. But Lord, I believe that you died to pay for my sins. And Lord, right now, I'd like to pray and ask you to forgive me and save me. And then just say, Jesus, forgive me. Come live in my heart. Save me. That's what I did 35 years ago, tomorrow, my spiritual birthday. I said, Lord, forgive me. Please save me. He actually moved in, started making a brand new person out of me. Started working on things. Boy, when he moved in, he had a long list of things to work on. He still got a few. I won't tell you what they are, but okay. Uh, at least he's in there working. Would you like to get Jesus in your life and get him to start working on making you a brand new person? Just invite him in. Ask him to save you. And then write this date down and say, today's my spiritual birthday into God's family. And give us a call. We'll be glad to uh, rejoice with you if you did that. And, and we've got a book we send out to folks who ask Christ to uh, save them through our video series called The Next Step. What do I do now? Okay? Here's the next step. How to get involved, get busy, how to grow. So, Wayne Strickland picked out his tombstone. Wayne Strickland, atheist, he says. That's brilliant. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Did you know God does not believe in atheists? Ray Comfort's a good friend of mine. He's got a school called The Way of the Master. If you want to learn to be a better soul winner, get on my website, drdino.com, and click the button, The Way of the Master, and get his course on how to be a better soul winner. Listen, God is not willing that any should perish. It doesn't matter what you've done. His blood can cleanse you from all iniquity. He can save you. If you're a Christian, then what on earth are you doing, for heaven's sake? Everybody ought to find something to do for the Lord. Witness to somebody. You know, give them a gospel track. You say, I don't want to drive them off. What are you going to drive them off to? Hell number two? I mean, come on. <laughs> Find something to do for the Lord with your life. What on earth are you doing, for heaven's sake? If we can help, our material is there to help you. I've got materials on the table over there. Get one of our catalogs. We have videos. It's on debates I've done at universities, topical series, other stuff, not creation. And then the blue series is all about creation. The seminar you heard tonight is seminar part 1B. 
about creation. There's a whole lot more on there. Our material is not copyrighted. Feel free to copy it and give it to your friends. As long as you're not selling it, just copy it and give it away. Use it as a witnessing tool. We have lots of material. Our Dr. Kaboom Kabang series, a lot of homeschool materials, college classes. Go to the website, drdino.com, and feel free to call us if we can help. If you're not a Christian, that's most important. You need to come and let somebody take a Bible tonight, take you off where it's quiet someplace, and explain to you from that book how you can have your sins forgiven. If you are a Christian, maybe you need to hit the altar and say, Lord, uh, I'm not doing much for you. Forgive me. Show me what you want to do. Get me busy in your service. Let's all stand, bow our heads and close our eyes. We'll pray and then we'll take a break and then we'll have Q&A time after this for those that want to stay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. Lord, thank you for all these people coming out. I pray that our faith in your word will be strengthened as a result of these things we've heard tonight. Lord, there might be some people here that are, that are not saved. If they die on the way home tonight, or if they die tomorrow, or if they die a hundred years from now, they're going to hell. Lord, I know you don't want that, but I know you are angry with the wicked every day. And you certainly will judge their sin, no question. You offered an escape through Jesus, and if they don't want it, then they'll pay for their own sin. Lord, please help them to come and let somebody take a Bible and show them how to be saved tonight. And Lord, there might be some of your children here. They're saved, but they're wasting their life on things that are all going to burn. They're going to work, work, work for a big house, big boat, big car, and it's all going to burn. They're going to leave it all behind. Oh, Father, help them to invest their life in something of eternal value. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help. Do you want to know more about how to combat the godless theory of evolution? Creation Science Evangelism offers four great tools that help strengthen the faith of believers and win the lost to Christ. After 15 years of teaching high school science, Dr. Hoven began Creation Science Evangelism in 1989. We are a ministry that is dedicated to providing tools which will help you combat the evolution philosophy that is destroying the faith of millions every year. The first tool Creation Science offers is their powerful, life-changing video series. Over the last 12 years, well over a million videotapes of Dr. Hovind's seminar have circled the globe. They are reaping a harvest of souls for the kingdom of Christ, as well as helping restore the faith of many thousands confused by the evolution propaganda to which they've been subjected. These videos are available in English, Russian, French, Spanish, Japanese, and sign language. The Age of the Earth, first of the seven-part series, teaches that God created the universe about 6,000 years ago in six literal days. Could this be true? 
Can it be scientifically proven that the Earth is not billions of years old? This tape gives solid scientific evidence that the Earth is young and that the Bible is scientifically accurate. How did the environment of the original creation differ from ours today? And how would this allow men to live over 900 years? Can Christians have a good explanation for the existence of dinosaurs? Could some dinosaurs still be alive today? These and many more questions are covered in the second and third part of the series. Evolution has permeated public school textbooks with false and fraudulent information. This video exposes nearly 30 lies commonly found in textbooks. Every public school student, teacher, and school board member needs to watch part four of this series. Find out if you have been lied to in your textbooks. Discover the terrible difference evolutionary beliefs have made in the past as well as in recent history in our video number five. Dictators throughout time have used their evolution-based philosophies to rationalize their brutal actions. Learn how evolution propaganda is being used today to prepare people for the new world order. This is just a taste of all the information the 17-hour seminar series has to offer. Also available are college courses that expand on the seminars in great detail. For those who can handle a more confrontational atmosphere, our debate series is just for you. I said, now, Mr. Patterson, if you think the tailbone is a vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. Dr. Hovind has debated a wide range of atheists and evolutionists all over the country. And you're sure to find these 12 debates very exciting. These would be perfect to present to that scientifically minded person who likes to argue their point. Our topical series includes exciting topics like why evolution is stupid, public school presentation, children's video about dinosaurs, the Bible and health, Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon, and many more. Creation Science also offers a variety of visuals like the longevity chart which presents the entire lineage of Adam to Joseph as given in Genesis. It's exciting to see exactly how many generations were alive at the same time. Hundreds of books on a variety of subjects, videos on incredible creatures that defy evolution, t-shirts, fossils, and more. Make Creation Science Evangelism the one-stop shopping center for your creation material needs. Our two websites, www.drdino.com and www.dinosauradventureland.com, provide our second tool for evangelism. Drdino.com is packed with lots of information, from charts and graphs to articles and frequently asked questions. This is also where you will find more information on all of the products CSE has to offer. Dinosauradventureland.com is great for the kids. They can play lots of fun games and see unusual rides and activities located at Dinosaur Adventure Land in Pensacola, Florida. Thousands visit our sites regularly to gain insight into God's creation. The third tool available to you is the live seminars conducted by Dr. Hovind and his son Eric. Since 1989, Dr. Hovind has held seminars and debates in hundreds of churches, schools, and universities in 49 states and 30 foreign countries. His fast-paced, illustrated seminars cover diverse topics, such as evidence for a young earth, how long Adam lived, dinosaurs living with man, where races came from, radiometric dating, and much more. Our fourth tool is the new, exciting Dinosaur Adventure Land. Many thousands have come from all across America to visit our museum, creation bookstore, science center, and theme park, where God gets the glory for science. Our unusual swings, rides, and activities each have a science lesson as well as a spiritual lesson. Captivate everyone from age 4 to 94. To order material, find out how to schedule a seminar at your church, or get more information about Dinosaur Adventureland, write to us at Creation Science Evangelism 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503. Or call us at 850-479-3466. Or toll free in the U.S., 877-479-3466.